Thank you very much. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, yeah, and as Greg said, I'm, I'm, um, I'm actually on sabbatical this year, spending time making quilts mostly. Um, but I also have seven PhD students, and they're all keeping me busy with all the other stuff. Um, so today I'm going to give a talk which is uh, fairly policy oriented and um, uh, kind of covers a lot of ground about privacy and policy from um, about 17 years of, of uh, dealing with privacy and policy and standards and things like that. Um, so I have a lot that I want to um, cram in here, but um, hopefully I'll give you enough of a taste of, of each of the pieces that there'll be some, um, some, some theme and, and takeaway that all makes sense. Um, uh, as, as Greg mentioned, I uh, direct the, uh, the CUPS lab at CMU, and this is um, not everybody, but the people who were there that day when we took the photo um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I also have some copies of our newsletter if anybody's interested in reading more about the lab um, or our new Privacy Engineering Master's program, um, which we're recruiting students for. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about, um, many of the people you see in this picture are involved. Uh, you'll see there, there are lots of co-authors um, of, of this work. OK, so let's uh, start with privacy. Um, privacy is a term that has many, many definitions. Um, so we're going to just um, pick one to, uh, to talk about here. Um, not that any of the others are any better or worse than, than this one, but we'll start somewhere. Uh, this one comes from Alan Weston, who um, is, is kind of one of the fathers of um, privacy in the United States and privacy policy work. Um, he just passed away a few months ago. Um, but he, he wrote um, a, a very seminal book back in 1967. It's about this thick. Um, and nobody reads the whole book. They do read the first chapter, which has this definition, um, that privacy is the claim of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. So this is a definition of privacy, which is talking about privacy as control that it's not that you don't have access to my information, but that I choose whether you have access to my information. Um, and that's the definition of, of privacy on which a lot of um, US privacy policy is based. Um, so given that, how do we protect privacy? Um, well, in the United States, we do have some privacy laws, but not really very many. And they're not really all that far reaching. Um, in other countries, the, the, the situation is very different. But, it, but in the US, um, for the most part, you don't have a right to privacy. Um, in certain sectors, there are companies that are regulated and are restricted about how they use your information. But in other sectors, there's absolutely no restrictions. Um, for the most part, the main uh, way that your privacy is protected uh, through law in the United States is actually through um, uh, deceptive practices. So the Federal Trade Commission and the, and the state attorney generals can go after companies that do deceptive things or fraudulent things. And so if a company says, I will protect your privacy, and they don't, then that's fraudulent or deceptive. And they can go after them for that, but not because they've broken any particular privacy law. So that, that's, that's kind of in a nutshell how, how our privacy works in the United States. There are some specific areas, such as healthcare, where we do have some specific laws. Um, one of our best privacy laws in the United States um, covers your video rental records, um, which of course are very important records to keep private. Um, <laughs> right. So we also have privacy enhancing technologies. And, um, and there's of course some, some very interesting um, computerized privacy enhancing technologies. But we also have things like shades and fences, which arguably provide some of the best privacy protection that we have um, right now. Um, and then we have privacy self-regulation. And privacy self-regulation is basically that companies have said, we're voluntarily going to protect the privacy of the people that we collect data from. Um, and in order to demonstrate our good faith and to convince our um, policymakers that they don't need to go pass new laws, uh, um, we're going to have these industry groups. And we're going to come together and say, we've adopted these industry guidelines for our industry. And we're going to self-regulate. We, we have said that in our industry, we don't do bad things on privacy. Um, and so uh, privacy self-regulation is actually largely what is driving privacy um, in the United States uh, with respect to commercial data or, or data, uh, data about people that companies collect. Um, and at the core of privacy self-regulation is the concept of notice and choice. Um, what is notice and choice? Um, the idea is that if a company 
gives you notice about what data they collect and what, what they do with it. Um, and they give you some choices about whether or not they're going to do those things. Um, then your privacy is protected, is notice and choice. Um, now, there, there's a lot of disagreement about whether that's sufficient. Um, there are a lot of people who will argue that, that you should have a fundamental right to privacy. And you know, if, if somebody says, I am going to invade your privacy, that should be against the law. They shouldn't be allowed to just give you notice and say, I am going to invade your privacy. Um, that, but um, in the US, in fact, it, except in, in specific sectors, that, that is fine. Somebody can say, I'm going to invade your privacy. And, and as long as they've given you notice, then they can go right ahead and do that. Um, uh, choices also, um, in, some, in some industries, there are specific choices that companies have to give you, that, that they're not allowed to do certain things unless they give you the option of saying, no, you can't do that. Um, but in other industries, there are no choices at all. And even in the regulated industries, they don't have to give you a choice about everything. Um, so your bank can actually do a lot of things with your financial information besides you know, run your accounts and manage your money. Um, they, they actually can take that information and use it for marketing and things like that. Um, there are some types of marketing activities that they have to let you opt out of, but not all of them, only some of them. All right, so even if you buy this whole notice and choice thing, um, there's a big, big flaw with it. And that is that it assumes that people actually read the notices. Um, notices don't, don't do us any good if they're out there and nobody actually reads them. Um, and, but the problem is, is that nobody really wants to read privacy notices. Um, I, have any of you ever tried to read a privacy policy? Show of hands. Yeah. Yeah, a few of them? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I teach a privacy class, and I always give a homework assignment towards the beginning of the semester where I make people go read like five privacy policies. You know, and the moans and groans I get from the students, oh my gosh, it's the worst homework assignment ever. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really painful. Um, so, so um, privacy policies are not all that useful if nobody is going to read them. Um, another problem we have is that there are too many to read. So you know, if I go to a website, say the New York Times, um, really it's not enough to just read the New York Times privacy policy. I have this tool called Ghostery in my web browser. And it um, goes and finds all of the um, companies that have put trackers on this web page. And so they're going to be collecting information about me. So I should really go read all of their privacy policies. And you can see there's six of them listed here. And actually, there's even more. If I scroll down, there's several others. And really, I should go read all of those privacy policies, too. And I'm, I'm clearly not going to do that. Um, so a few years ago, one of my students, Alicia McDonald, who has since graduated um, and gone on to all sorts of other exciting things related to privacy, um, she came into my office and she says, well, what if people actually read privacy policies? And I said, don't be silly, Alicia. People don't read privacy policies. And she said, well, no, but what if they did? Could we figure out how much time they would spend actually reading privacy policies? Um, and so she did uh, kind of a back of the envelope calculation. Um, so she, she looked at, uh, she got some statistics about how many different websites people visit in a month. Um, she got some statistics on how long privacy policies are. Um, she got some statistics on the average adult reading speed of Americans. Um, and also um, uh, some, some uh, value of wages, as well as um, there are some uh, statistics on the value of leisure time and things like that. And, and she crunched all the numbers. And what she found out is that if you were to read every privacy policy of every website you visit, not, not, just, um, not every time you visit it, but once a month to make sure it didn't change, you would spend 244 hours a year reading privacy policies. Right? Clearly nobody, not even me, <laughs> nobody is going to do that. Um, that. That would just be ridiculous. Um, and so uh, th this is a, a paper. It was published in 2008. The work was actually done um, about a year before that. And um, you know, it's still like, getting cited all over the place, including like, on the floor of Congress and stuff. Because people look at that and go, yeah, see, it's ridiculous. We can't expect everybody to read privacy policies. All right, so what can we, yeah. Yeah. So is there any sense in which um, the privacy policy of the host site, in that case the New York Times, somehow is controlling? Like, I mean, the privacy policies often say things about information shared with third parties. Does it not count as sharing with a third party when they post a, you know, a allow a 
tracking company to have like something? Yeah, so, so it does count, but most privacy policies say something like, and we will share information with third parties that put trackers on our site and go read their policy if you want to find out what they do with it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it would be nice if, if the first party was totally accountable and could say something like, we do not allow trackers on our site unless they abide by our policy, which says A, B, and C, right? And then, and then you wouldn't have to go read all the other policies. Yeah. Um, well, well, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but yeah, the, the FTC has um, written several reports that have been calling for simplifying privacy policies. Um, and uh, you know, they say the FTC would really like it if you guys would simplify privacy policies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and th there, there, is, there is one area I'll show you in a minute. Um, in the financial area, they actually went a step further than saying they would really like it. And I'll, I'll show you what they've done. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, on the uh, issue of the cost, is there any aspect to crowdsource? Yeah, actually, there has been. Um, so there, there are a number of um, organizations that are making like browser plugins for privacy. Um, there's one called Privacy Choice that is doing a crowdsourced approach to reading and interpreting and providing a score on privacy policies. Um, so so th there, there definitely are some efforts along those lines. Yeah. Okay, so um, another approach, um, think back to 1996. Um, this is when I first started really getting into privacy. And um, the Federal Trade Commission was, um, that's when they first started looking at privacy. And they said to um, all the big companies that were doing um, internet data stuff at the time, IBM, AOL, AT&T, Microsoft, they said, we think there's some kind of an internet privacy problem. Uh, and worse, Congress thinks there's some kind of an internet privacy problem. What are you guys going to do about it so we don't regulate you? Um, and the industry said, oh, well, we're, we're all posting privacy policies. And at the time, they were actually just starting. Most of them weren't posting privacy policies. But they said, we'll get right on it. We'll get those privacy policies posted. And um, the FTC and some of the privacy advocates said, we don't really want to read these privacy policies. Um, you, you've got to do better than that. And the industry said, OK, we'll post them in a computer readable language. And your computer can read them for you. And the FTC said, ooh, now you're talking. This sounds good. Um, so uh, they, they decided they were going to come up with something for, called P3P, the Platform for Privacy Preferences. It's an XML language for privacy policies. Um, I got drafted early on to, um, to participate in that work um, and at some point became chair of the working group. Um, it, 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 we did not actually have a standard until 2002. Um, there is nothing technically difficult in this standard. It's an XML language for privacy policies. Um, it's actually kind of a bad XML language for privacy policies. And of that, I was uh, talking to Kobe earlier about how um, theoreticians hate it because it's, it's very imprecise in many ways. But it's an XML language for privacy policies. Um, but there is so much controversy about things like what should you say in a privacy policy? Is it important to let people know how long you're going to keep data? Well, there, there are some people involved in this debate who say, no, no, that's not an important thing to put in a privacy policy. And other people who say, oh, no, no, that's really important to put in a privacy policy. So it took a really, really long time. Um, and W3C finally came out with the P3P standard. And I wrote a book on it. Um, and um, Microsoft actually uh, implemented it in IE6 back then. Um, and then they re-implemented it in IE7, IE8, IE9. Um, so for over 10 years now, um, anybody who's used an IE browser has used a browser equipped with P3P. Um, and you know, on one, one hand, this sounds like fantastic. Um, however, uh, I've been following P3P very closely. So even though I'm no longer involved in W3C and the standards, a lot of the research that I've done since then has touched on P3P. And, and it's actually really nice as a research tool. Um, but what we found is that there's not widespread adoption of P3P. 
And the adoption that we have um, is really troubling uh, because people have actually used it as a way to circumvent the rules. And I'll get to that later. All right, so another thing that you could do is have a privacy nutrition label. And this is something that uh, folks at the FTC have been talking about for over 10 years now. Um, the, you'll, you'll hear like the FTC chairman will give a talk and say, um, we need privacy policies to be easier to read, like nutrition labels. And, and everybody said, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So a few years ago, I told my students, well, let's make a privacy nutrition label. You know, the FTC seems to want one. None of the companies are doing it, so let's do it. Um, so we spent a lot of time looking at nutrition labels and trying to understand why they were so great. Um, and uh, you know, here are the things that we came up with, is that you have a standardized format that allows people to um, get familiar with them. Like you know where to look for things. If, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need to watch your sodium, you can learn where sodium is in a nutrition label and easily spot it you know, from here on out. So, um, so, so that's what we wanted to do. We also wanted to make it easy to compare things. You can put these two boxes of cereal side by side, and you can easily compare the nutrients in them. So you should be able to do that with privacy policies, too. Um, they also have standardized language. Um, so you know, you're not born knowing what cholesterol is, but once you learn, that's always the term that's on the box. They don't like use some other term that sounds sort of similar. It's always cholesterol. Whereas if you read privacy policies, there's all sorts of terminology you've never heard of in them. Um, they're also brief, and, um, and they're linked to an extended view. So at the top, you have just kind of the facts. And then down here, you have the ingredients, which is, goes into more detail. And with a privacy policy, we could imagine you'd have even more detail that you could go into. Um, but you have, you have that kind of extended view. Uh, so we took an iterative design process to uh, develop a privacy nutrition label. Um, and I'm not going to go through it all, but we have two papers on it if you care to go read them. Um, but basically, uh, we had a series of studies, including focus groups, lab studies, and online studies. Um, and we, we experimented with a lot of different approaches to conveying the privacy information, what terms made sense to people, what didn't, what format, how much information. Um, one of our early designs um, was just completely overwhelming to people. It, it, it was beautiful. It had so much information. You know, privacy geeks, we were like, wow, it shows you everything. And everybody else who looked at it was just like, what is this? It's just too much. Um, but we finally got down to something that looks kind of like this. Um, it's a little washed out on the screen. There, there's blue on it, too, um, besides the red. Um, so basically, what, you, what you're seeing here is across the top are ways that information is used. And across the, um, the left side are different categories of information. And so each cell, you can see um, whether that information is collected and used, and whether there are opportunities to opt in or opt out of that use. Um, so we did studies with this and found that this was something um, that people actually liked quite a bit. And we, we asked them to do tasks of finding information and privacy policies using this and using other alternative formats. And this was the one that people could more quickly and easily and accurately find information relevant to their privacy. Okay. Um, where I said that there, there's one area where the FTC is um, uh, doing more than just saying we'd like short policies, and that is in the financial area. Um, so there is a standard um, model uh, privacy notice form for financial institutions. Um, they are not required to use it, but they have some strong incentives to use it. That basically, if they go ahead and, um, and use the, the, um, the model uh, form, the, um, the regu financial regulators kind of stay off their, their backs on a lot of other things. Um, and so we've found that um, over the past couple of years, we now have probably nearly 100% adoption um, by financial institutions in the US. Um, this is what PNC banks uh, look like. It, it actually goes a little bit further, but that's, that's the first page of it. There's a, a print format as well as an online um, format. They have a, a generator. You can go type in information, and it will generate a PDF for you. Um, and uh, it, you know, that it's, it seems um, pretty nice. Um, but um, er, once the uh, FTC came out with this, they, they kind of declared victory and said, you know, we, we've done this thing, um, and, and we're done. Um, and nobody ever stopped to look at, is it, is it actually doing any, any good? Um, so um, my students are actually right now finishing up a study um, we went and crawled the web, and we found over 3,000 of these policies. Um, we parsed them, because they're not computer readable, but they're standard enough that you, know, you can parse the PDF and extract the information. 
Um, we found companies that had not used the generator to generate them and had rolled their own and had misspellings and all sorts of other things. Companies that insisted in converting it to HTML and introducing errors, but we were still able to parse um, the vast majority of them. Um, and what we found, though, there, there are some problems. Um, uh, you know, the good thing is that everybody is using them. Um, the bad thing is there are some actually fundamental problems with the form itself. Um, so a big one that we found is that if you look in the, the second row where it says what, what, what it says uh, up there is um, what type of data the financial company collects. And there's actually room for no more than six types of data. And if you have more than six types of data, which most financial institutions do, you're, the, the regulation says only list six types of data. So you know nothing about the other types of data they collect. Um, and that, that just seems wrong. <laughs> um, and I don't know why it's in the regulation. That's something we're going to be following up on. Um, we also found that uh, uh, most of the banks that are using this seem to have removed their full um, English language privacy policies from their websites. So this doesn't link to more information. This is it. And if you want more details, I, I don't know what you do. That, that, that's it. And that, that also seems um, wrong. Um, we also found in the process of doing that, w this, um, there were some that, that are clearly not complying with the regulation. They had made up things that are not in the regulation and they'd stuck them in there. Um, or uh, here you see there's some yeses and nos. Some of these it actually is mandated by law what the answer has to be. Um, and in, in some cases it wasn't very many, but there were some that had the wrong answer. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so there doesn't appear to be any enforcement. Um, now, it'll be interesting to see when we publish our paper and you know, we can provide the list of the, of the banks that have the wrong answer to see whether anyone follows up with them and says, um, no, this is against the law. So. All right, another approach is um, privacy icons. Um, there, uh, uh, yeah. No, no. As far as I know, there have been no empirical research at all about financial privacy notices um, since that came out, other than the project that we're working on right now. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they, I have lots of questions now. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think hopefully we've opened the door and, and people will be doing more of this empirical research. Yeah. Um, all right, so privacy icons. Um, uh, that's been kind of a dream of a lot of people for a while is, you know, let's not have to read these policies. Let's just boil it down to some icons, um, whether it's reported by the companies or we could crowdsource and come up with the icons that, that you'd want to uh, have. Um, there have been a number of efforts to create privacy icons. This one came from um, Mozilla a couple of years ago. Um, uh, there, there are a number of others who've come up with them. Um, privacy icons are really difficult because privacy is not a concept that lends itself well to visualization. Um, but, uh, but, but people have tried. Um, and uh, none of these have really gone anywhere yet. Um, you know, maybe they will. I, this particular set you know, was actually heralded with, with some fanfare. And I, I've looked at it, and, and I just don't get it. Um, and we've actually, uh, as a class project in one of my classes, some students um, ran a study to see if people understood these things. And um, you know, this one here, which means data is given to law enforcement only when legal process is followed. You, know, you show it to people, and people are like, uh, when you drive on the wrong side of the road, you, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not at all obvious what this means. <laughs> so. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Oh, I get to play pool with my private. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, um, <laughs> so that's kind of like what's been happening. Um, in the meantime, there's been a lot of media attention to privacy of late, and a lot of government attention. Um, so last year, both the FTC and the White House came out with privacy reports. Um, these were major reports. There was a big release party with each of them, and um, it was all very exciting. Um, and uh, you know, the, the FTC report basically said, you guys need to have clearer privacy notices, and you need to um, not do some things that are really bad. But uh, <laughs> you know, there, there wasn't any really specific actionable um, things in it. Um, the, uh, the Department of Commerce White House report um, said that we need to have a multi-stakeholder process in order to come up with better privacy self-regulation. Um, and so they launched a multi-stakeholder process about a year ago. Um, and they decided that the first thing that the process would tackle is um, mobile app privacy. 
Um, so they've had about monthly meetings for the past year um, trying to figure out what kind of guidelines they're going to have for mobile app developers to help uh, protect privacy. Um, and um, they are still fighting over um, you know, what information should be disclosed to people. Um, and they're, they're having a big discussion right now about whether or not they should do any usability testing of the guidelines they come up with. Um, there, there are a lot of people who, who um, would like to do it. Um, they don't have any budget to hire any usability people, so they would have to uh, basically have the companies involved, you know, pass the hat around or something. Um, and then they also said, well, it took us a year to get this list of um, things that we should disclose. And if we have usability testing, they'll probably tell us your problems with it, and then we'll have to spend another year. So um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Um, Another thing that's happening is the Digital Advertising Alliance, which is an industry group of online advertisers. Um, they came up with a set of principles in 2009, um, which they felt uh, were, were doing the right thing and doing the kinds of things the FTC was asking them to do. Um, so they, you know, they said that you have to tell people about what you're doing. You have to give consumers control. You have to be transparent. Um, so these, these all sound like good things. Um, as part of that, they have come up with a whole program um, that, that has an icon that you're supposed to see on ads. Um, looks like this. Anybody recognize this symbol? Anybody think you've seen it before? Ad choices, yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah, so I, I actually um, taught a, um, an exec ed class to um, chief information security officers a few weeks ago. So security people, right? And I showed them this, and they all said they'd never seen it before. So then I said, well, um, they all were sitting there with laptops in front of them. So I said, well, you know, go to a website where there's news and you know, see if you can find it. And so they all you know, went, and you know, eventually they were like, oh, that thing in the corner. Oh, is, is that what you're talking about? It, it, it was really amazing seeing these people who you would think would be somewhat informed about these things. And absolutely none of them had, had ever noticed that they'd seen it before, even though, in fact, they all should have seen it. They've all visited websites where it is. So um, that's only to say that, that this is, this, is the, this big program. The ad industry has been going in front of Congress and the FTC and making a big deal out of it and saying that they have solved the problems about targeted advertising, um, they've solved the problem by making sure consumers are aware of what's going on. And it doesn't appear that people are very aware. Um, all right, so besides that, um, all of the major browser vendors have added um, all sorts of privacy settings. Um, there are things that allow you to block cookies. Um, as I said, P3P is built into Internet Explorer. Um, there's something called tracking protection list that's also built into Internet Explorer um, because Internet Explorer likes to have all of the privacy tools all mixed up in, in one. Um, and then there's something called do not track, um, which is now built into several browsers. Um, and do not track is a process at W3C. They're, they're um, trying to standardize do not track. Um, and they have spent, um, they're going on two years on do not track. Um, Alicia McDonald, uh, the student who did the, the work on the cost of, of privacy notices, actually chaired that for the first year um, before she ran screaming from the group, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, they, the best I can tell, they've been working on it for about two years, and they still have not come up with a definition of tracking or not tracking. Um, and so therefore, we, we do not, as of yet, have a do not track standard. Um, so uh, what else do we have? Browser add-ons. I mentioned that there are a bunch of those um, that third parties are developing. Um, we have this concept of an opt-out cookie um, for, um, for behavioral advertising. Um, a lot of the tracking that's done for advertising is through cookies. And so um, there are a lot of companies that say, hey, if you don't want us to target ads to you, we will set a special cookie that says you've opted out. Um, and that's, that's really nice, except that people don't realize that's how it works. So they go and delete their cookies, and they delete their opt-out cookies, too. Um, should do that. OK. Um, yeah, so do not track, as I just mentioned. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea with do not track is to make it really easy to say, hey, stop tracking me. And you should just be able to go press a big red button, or in this case, check a box. And your web browser should broadcast to all the sites you visit, hey, this person doesn't want to be tracked. Um, and uh, it looks something like that. Okay. 
All right, so I've kind of run through a lot of different tools and approaches um, to notice and choice. And, um, and as I said, they have a lot of support from industry and the FTC and the White House. Um, but for the most part, nobody's asking any questions about whether they work. They're just saying, oh, great, new tool. That's fantastic. You know, Self-regulation is working. Um, but I don't think it is. Um, and so uh, for the past few years, we've been doing some studies to try to understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, and uh, there, there's a bunch of different aspects of it. Um, the, uh, the second bolt there, do the tools work? Um, you know, is the technology actually blocking what it says it's blocking? Um, uh, we've done a little bit of work in that area, and there are others who've done even more work on that. Um, what I'm going to focus on here, though, is the bit of whether consumers can actually use the tools. You know, assuming that they actually do what they say they do, which is not a 100% valid assumption, but we'll, we'll, we'll assume that, um, can consumers actually use them? Um, so I'm going to uh, give you a very short summary of three studies that we've done. Um, and we'll start with the first one. Um, smart, useful, scary, creepy, perceptions of behavioral advertising. Um, so the, the idea here was to, to understand what end users think about online behavioral advertising, what, what they know about it, um, and then um, whether their mental models about OBA, um, are, how, how they actually conform with the notice and choice mechanisms that have been provided um, for them. So we um, invited 48 participants into our lab um, for um, both an interview and a usability study. Um, and um, we, they, these were all people who were recruited from the Pittsburgh region. Um, we, we screened people so that we did not have technologists. Um, and, and in our advertising, we said, come do a study um, and learn how to protect your privacy online or something like that. So people knew that it was about privacy um, going in. All right, so uh, the first thing we did was to try to find out what they already knew about advertising and about online behavioral advertising. Um, we found that people knew very little. Um, they knew they didn't like advertising, and they knew very little about OBA. Um, so we showed them a video from the Wall Street Journal um, and uh, used that as a, as a discussion um, uh, piece for them. Um, Right. So uh, we found that, that people were aware that there was some kind of targeted advertising online. But for the most part, they were of the opinion that it was happening similar to what happens on Amazon, where you go look at one product, and then Amazon starts recommending to you similar products. Um, so that they understood was happening. Um, likewise, they understood that when you search for something on Google, the search results include some paid ads related to your search. Um, but they didn't understand that this actually happens across websites um, and that the things you do on one website are going to um, influence the ads you see on another uh, website. A lot of people were completely unaware that that happened. Um, when, um, uh, yeah, there were, there were also people who thought that it was a hypothetical thing. Oh, yeah, I heard maybe that could happen, but, but nobody's doing it, right? Um, uh, so that, that was kind of interesting. Um, we showed them uh, ads that had the ad choices disclosure on them. Um, and we asked them, you know, what, what do you think um, this means? Um, and people had no idea. They, they hadn't seen it. They thought maybe you click on it if you wanted to express interest in the product. Uh, maybe it's like a your ad here thing if you want to buy an ad on this website. Um, and uh, they were, there were very few people who realized that it had anything to do with tracking. That, that was like, really the minority of people. Um, and most people said that they would not click on it because they'd be afraid to, that they thought they'd get more ads. Um, we asked people after we'd had this whole discussion with them and informed them about OBA, what do they think of it? Um, people did recognize that it could be beneficial to advertisers. They did, they did understand the argument that having ads about things you might be interested in would, could be a good thing. Um, but at the same time, they had a lot of privacy concerns. And they really felt like this was happening behind their backs. Nobody had told them about it. And they didn't think it was fair or right. Um, they also had a lot of misconceptions. Despite the fact that we had told them accurately about how this works, they had inferred all sorts of other things. So when they heard that they were being tracked, they assumed that these advertisers were collecting their credit card number. Um, all sorts of things that advertisers, as far as I know, are not actually collecting. Um, they, they, so they were very concerned that if they were, uh, had targeted ads, that could lead to identity theft. 
Um, and while I can imagine a scenario where that could happen, um, I don't know of any evidence that that has actually happened or that that's one of the larger threats um, uh, involved. But that was something that was very much on people's minds. Um, um, when we ask people, now that they know about this, what would you do to, to stop it, um, the number one thing people said is I would delete cookies, um, which is actually counterproductive because you delete the opt-out cookies. Um, there were a lot of people who said it doesn't look like I have any options. There's probably nothing I can do. Um, there are people who said, well, maybe my antivirus software protects me. Um, at the time we did the study, um, the, the major um, AV providers were just starting to add um, so something with do not track and things like that to the suites. Now, now they have some protection, but, but only if you turn it on. Um, and then there were people who said, uh, there are some settings in my web browser. I don't know what they are, and I don't know what to do with them, but I think there are some settings in my web browser, which, which is sort of true. Um, we showed people the names of a bunch of these tracking companies. Um, and if you, if you install third-party add-on software, that helps you uh, block tracking, uh, you will see a long list of tracking companies, dozens or hundreds of companies. And you can, on a per company basis, decide whether or not to let them track you. So we showed them um, these companies and asked them, you know, would you allow them to track you? And what we found is that for the companies they've never heard of, so 24-7 Real Media, Blue Kai, right? these are companies that nobody had ever heard of. Um, they say they're not familiar, and so I don't trust them. Why would I let this company I've never heard of track me? Over here, we have the companies that people had heard of. Um, so AOL, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google. Um, and here, the level of trust varies. And it has absolutely nothing to do with their privacy policy or their tracking or anything like that. Um, what we found was things like, um, oh, Google. Yeah, yeah, they're a good company. I use their search engine all the time. Yeah, sure, they can track me. Um, AOL, oh, I used to have an AOL account. Really crappy internet service. No, I don't want them to track me. <laughs> Um, Microsoft? Microsoft Advertising? Really? No, I already have a computer. I don't need another one. I, I, I don't think I want to give any information to Microsoft. They'll, they'll t just try to sell me another computer. I don't need that. Um, so their decisions have nothing to do with any of the things that they should do um, in order to make an informed decision here. Um, we also gave people a bunch of scenarios um, uh, to, to see whether they would allow um, their information to be collected um, during different scenarios, and we found it was all over the place. There were some scenarios that some people said were fine and others that other people said were fine, and they had all sorts of different reasons um, why. So it, it wasn't a one-size-fits-all that everybody was in agreement about what information they'd provide in what circumstances. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next study. Um, and so the next study, um, Why Johnny Can't Opt Out, um, is, is actually a continuation of the first one. So it was actually the same interviews that we did with people. We then, after the interview, moved them on to a us usability study where they were assigned to test one tool. Um, and so we had um, three different sets of tools that were tested. I think there were a total of nine tools we tested. And those include blocking tools you could add to your web browser, there are opt-out tools provided by the industry, and then the privacy tools that were built into the Firefox and IE web browsers. Um, and uh, let's see. OK, so what we, what we did is we, uh, we gave them all an email from a friend um, saying, hey, I just heard about this great new privacy tool that will help you stop tracking. Here's the link. Uh, why don't you download it and try it out? Um, so then people would go visit the, the company website, read about it, and install it in, in the web browser of the laptop that we had provided them. Um, then uh, we asked them to change the settings of the tool to be the settings that they personally would want when they browse the internet. Um, and then um, we, we, uh, gave, we gave them a specific set of settings. And we said, OK, imagine you're setting this up for a friend, and they want these settings. Can you make it do that? Um, and then we gave them some browsing scenarios um, where we knew that the settings we had given them would cause things to break. Um, and we wanted to see whether they would realize what was causing them to break and whether they could fix it. Um, and we had a bunch of um, follow-up uh, uh, survey items. Right, so I don't have time to get into detail, but high-level results here. A lot of problematic defaults. People assumed it's a privacy tool. If I'm installing a privacy tool, it is going to protect my privacy. Actually, most of the privacy tools don't really do very much until you actually adjust the settings to protect your privacy. And people didn't realize that. 
Um, lots of really bad user interfaces, jargon, terminology people didn't understand. Um, a lot of the tools had no feedback. You, you turn it on, and it's running, and it looks no different than before you turned it on, and it wasn't running. Um, Ghostery was an exception, where Ghostery actually has something in the corner of your screen at all times, and people liked having that kind of feedback. Um, let's see. Uh, the opt-out tools uh, from the industry, uh, when people would see that they could go somewhere and opt out, they assumed that they were opting out of being tracked. In reality, what you're being opting out of is targeted advertising. The companies can still collect your information. They can still track you. They can still store your information. They're just not allowed to use it for targeted advertising. And people didn't understand that. Um, and then uh, being able to make meaningful decisions on a per company basis, that was just kind of ridiculous. People had, had no meaningful way to do that. Um, just to show you a few quick examples, this is the DAA website where you can go to opt out. Um, and we asked people to go here and opt out. And people spend a long time trying to figure out what to do. Um, what you're supposed to do is to click on that check mark. It, it doesn't really look clickable. <laughs> Um, but that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, and there's also a little tiny link down there. You could click on that instead. Yeah. Um, we found uh, if you go to some of these sites uh, to opt out, it gives you a long list of, um, of uh, different trackers. And, um, and you have to decide which ones you want to opt out of. And some of them, it will say, you can't opt out automatically here. You have to actually go visit that tra tracking company site to opt out. But some of them weren't in English. So we actually had one participant who went to Google Translate to cut and paste the text in to figure out how to opt out. I don't think most people would do that. Um, the Ghostry interface had all sorts of language people didn't understand, like dynamically inserted page elements and things like that. Um, let me skip over that. Um, the Internet Explorer tracking protection list, um, you install it and you assume it's doing something. But actually, you have to go down here to get a tracking protection list online. Um, if you don't do that, it's not actually doing a whole lot. Um, there's also some really interesting terminology in the Internet Explorer privacy settings related to P3P. Um, they talk about compact privacy policies um, and other interesting terms um, that people don't understand. So speaking of compact privacy policies, this brings us back to P3P. Real quick, and then I have to yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, the idea of using the cookie helps a lot to track what the site has been calling. So when you use the site for information that it's been just tracked, is there a way that you can do it without using that cookie? Or do you need to remind the IP address to that one? There, there are alternative ways of doing it um, that increasingly some of them are, are now using. Um, but Originally, they were all using opt-out cookies. And even now, a lot of them still use opt-out cookies. Yeah. So, um, OK, so um, P3P compact policies. Uh, so uh, about a year ago, um, there was this flack. It was in the media for a few days back in February, um, which was fascinating, very fascinating to me, but probably to nobody else. Um, uh, but uh, it came out that Google was bypassing Microsoft's privacy settings in their web browser. Um, and, um, and, and the Microsoft IE team blogged about it um, and said, wow, we've just discovered this. And this would have been a really nice thing for Microsoft to blog about um, had it been true that they had just discovered it. But in fact, my students and I had written a paper on this fact a year earlier. And they, they had a copy of the paper. So this wasn't you know, a sudden revelation um, uh, of, of that. Um, it's something that had been going on for quite some time. And, and basically, what we, what we found was that um, the P3P compact privacy policies are basically a shorthand for that full XML privacy policy. It's a bunch of tokens. And um, Microsoft makes cookie blocking decisions in IE based on these tokens. And the default setting, if you never touch your privacy settings in IE, the default setting is to actually make cookie blocking decisions based on this. And if you don't have a P3P compact policy associated with a third party cookie, it will get blocked. Um, and if you do have a P3P compact policy, um, it has to meet Microsoft's qualifications for a good policy in order to not have it blocked. So what is a good policy? Well, Microsoft has a list of tokens which it considers bad. And if your policy includes bad tokens, then you don't have a good policy. That is the definition. All right, now being computer scientists, you might start seeing there might be some problems here. If the policy includes bad tokens, it is not a good policy. 
So what if it includes um, non-valid tokens? Good policy. What if it includes no tokens? Good policy. Um, and so companies discovered this, and they said, oh, wow, look at that. We can actually have our policy accepted as a good policy without lying about what we do. Isn't that nice? <laughs> um, so um, I'm not going to go into the details of that other than to say we, we did a study. We, we crawled the web. We found 33,000 of these policies. We found um, some good evidence that at least a third of them were, um, were bypassing Microsoft settings by having these improper policies. Um, this was happening with big companies, little companies. It didn't matter um, all over the board. And there was a lot of evidence that they knew full well what they were doing. Um, and uh, very frustratingly, um, the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission didn't do anything about it. Um, and um, the, about the only thing that happened is we, we actually traced um, some of this problem back to Microsoft themselves. We found a Microsoft um, knowledge base thing that um, you know, somebody said, you know, my cookies are getting blocked, what can I do? And they said, oh, you can add a P3P compact policy. And you know, here's an example. And people were just copying the example and putting it into their their policy, whether it actually reflected what they did or not. Um, now, Microsoft, of course, said, well, we didn't mean for them to use this example. I mean, this is just an example. Of course, you're supposed to put your own policy there. Um, but we found several thousand that all had exactly that example. So when the news broke about this, Microsoft very quickly did take down this page. So um, that was good. Um, but that, that was about all that happened. Um, Let's see, we, we found uh, Amazon was doing this. AMZN was their um, compact policy token. It doesn't mean anything in P3P. Um, <laughs> Facebook, theirs was DSP law, which, um, which those were both valid tokens, but you're supposed to have at least five, and they only had two. And previously, they had the word honk as their policy. Um, so this got picked up in the New York Times. Um, we, we, did, um, we did the study again, and we found that there were some changes. Um, the most interesting one was Facebook's new compact policy was Facebook does not have a P3P policy, learn why here, um, which is a valid, good policy, according to Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit against uh, Amazon. It's um, working its way through the courts. It, it's still going forward, as far as I know. But um, nobody thinks it's actually going to get anywhere. Um, yeah, so then there was this whole thing in the news. Um, yeah, so uh, as somebody who's been following this field, um, this is really, really depressing. Um, and, uh, and it really makes you question whether s self regulation is going to, to do anything. Um, because it's pretty clear that you know, P3P, a, a standard that was developed, it took like six years to develop this standard. It's deployed in one of the largest web browsers, and companies are actively using it to skirt around and you know, basically circumvent it, and it's not protecting anyone's privacy. Um, and the companies involved in doing it, um, when, when asked, you know, they're telling the press, oh yeah, we're, we're circumventing it. P3P doesn't matter. P3P is a defunct standard. You know, it's obsolete, so we're going to do that. Um, and so, you know, look, go, looking forward at Do Not Track, which is the next standard. So when they decide they don't like Do Not Track, is that what they're going to do? All right, real quick, I'm going to show you one more study. Um, going back to um, this, this lovely little triangle icon, um, which the ad industry in the meantime has been going on and on about how wonderful it is. Um, uh, they, they serve 10 billion times a day. They're, they're helping people with it. It's pre sounds pretty impressive. Um, that, that was their response to our paper, um, our first paper on it, um, where we said that people couldn't use it. Um, we wanted to do a follow-up. You know, we, you know, to, they, they were right that we'd done a small study. Um, we had 48 participants. It was a small study. So they said, well, you know, what do you know? You only had 48 participants. So we said, fine, we're going to do a big study. Um, and so we said, we're going to get 1,500 participants and find out if they, they know about um, this, this icon. Um, so we used Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, over 1,500 participants, and um, it went something like this. Um, we showed them the New York Times website with some ads that had the ad choices icon in the corner. Um, we didn't tell them explicitly that it was there. We, we had them look at it and answer some questions about the, the page. Um, then, then we asked them some questions about whether their privacy was being protected. And, um, 
a few people noted the privacy policy at the bottom, but, but almost nobody mentioned the, the icons. Then we showed them an ad with the icon, and we um, specifically said, look at this icon. Um, we also um, had a few different conditions. In, in uh, some people, instead of showing them that icon, we showed them a different icon, the one on the right, which was one that the industry had considered and decided not to use. Um, instead of the word ad choices, we tried a bunch of other things, some of which are things that the industry had considered, some of which are things that we made up. Um, and we also had just nothing next to it as another thing we tested. Um, and then if they clicked on it, we would take them to what's called a landing page that would give you more privacy information and let you opt out. We tested the one from AOL, Yahoo, Microsoft, Google, and Monster. Um, okay. All right, so um, we, we uh, asked a bunch of questions that were asked on a, on a Likert scale to try to understand what information they were gleaning from the icon and the taglines. Um, so we wanted to know um, whether they understood that the ad had been tailored based on websites you have visited in the past. So this is a true statement. So you know, to what extent do you, do you think that this is conveyed? Um, so what you can see is that um, ad choices, 58% of the people, they actually get that message. So it means 40% of the people are missing the message. However, some of the other things, like why did I get this ad, that actually performs a lot better. Um, and uh, uh, the, the ad choices is actually kind of near the bottom as far as how you would communicate that fact. You know, if you were going to pick words to put next to it, I wouldn't put ad choices next to it based on, on, on this question. Um, we also asked people um, some questions to see whether they would actually click on it. Um, and so we gave them a bunch of statements. Some were true and some were false. Um, so uh, one of the statements was, uh, we'll take you to a page where you can tell the advertising company that you do not want to receive tailored ads. So this is a true statement. Um, and you can see that actually only 27% of the people realized that if they clicked, that's what would happen. So we're really not communicating that if you click on this icon, you're, you're able to opt out. That, that's not happening at all. Um, we also asked them, will it take you to a page where you can buy advertisements on this website? Right. This is a false statement. Um, but we can see that actually that, that performs pretty well. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so ad choice, 45% of the people thought that was true. Um, so more than who thought the true statement was true. All right, I'm going to uh, skip over the rest of them. Um, but basically what we found is that these icons and taglines are failing. I mean, based on pretty much every measure we threw at it, they were failing. Um, there are alternative phrases that actually do better. They're still not fantastic, but they do substantially and statistically significantly better. Um, and yet the industry has not switched over to those phrases, even though we told them two years ago. Um, and uh, they're continuing to go around saying that their whole campaign uh, with this has been a success. All right, let me wrap things up here. OK, so from all of these studies and my experience um, working in privacy policy and standards, um, here are some of the, my takeaways. Um, one big takeaway is um, that a lot of the privacy tools that are out there are really unusable and ineffective. Um, I think there are a lot of things that could be done that are easy to improve them. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. Um, I think a lot of these tools are not being developed by usability experts or even consulting usability experts. And you know, some, just some very simple things like making the wording like, understandable would actually help a lot. Um, but there's some of them that have some kind of fundamental problems. Um, you know, if, if the whole point of your tool is to, is to have people choose between this tracker and that tracker, I think that's kind of a non-starter. People are not going to be able to choose based on like, the names of these companies. You're going to have to try a different approach. Um, and then also, we found a big problem with these tools actually breaking websites. And of course, users don't want that to happen. So you need a privacy tool that's not going to break a website. Um, standardization. Um, so standardization seems like a really attractive thing because the, the current privacy policies are so bad. Um, and we've seen in our studies on the privacy nutrition label that standardization has promised that you could actually have some better results with standardized policies. But as we saw from the financial privacy notices, if you're going to have standardized policies, they need to say meaningful things or it's not going to be all that useful. Um, machine readable policies. 
Um, machine readable policies, in my view, are still even better than standardized policies because your computer can read them for you and can take action automatically without having to involve you in every decision. Um, and so I really think that that's where we want to go. Um, but uh, we need to make sure that, um, that they actually get adopted. Um, and what we've seen from P3P is that they can be an utter disaster. Um, and I think, you know, thinking back on my experience with P3P, I think, I still think the P3P concept was really good. There are definitely some details about it that, you know, if I were doing it again, I would do differently. But overall, I think the concept is good. Um, but there were, you know, a lot of reasons why it didn't actually pan out in this case. Um, but there's now, with many new efforts underway to try to um, come up with standardized or machine readable policies, um, I recommend that everybody go back and look at P3P because I think there's a lot that can be learned from P3P before you go and reinvent the, the um, wheel. All right, um, another um, idea here is that instead of saying, well, there's a zillion different privacy policies and we're going to describe in great detail all of the subtle differences between them, another approach is to say, no, actually, there's only a small number of different types of privacy policies. You know, there's type A, B, C, D, and E. Right? And depending on what you do, you put yourself in one of these buckets. And then a user can say, hey, you know, when I go to random websites, I'm happy with type A, B, or C websites. But if, if my health information is involved, it better be a type A website. Um, if we could boil things down into something much simpler, um, I think that has a lot of potential. Um, and I, I think it could be workable. Um, that said, I don't know anybody who's seriously proposing that except me. Um, and last slide, uh, incentives and enforcement. Um, I think a big problem we've had, not just with the kind of privacy tools that I've showed you, but with a lot of other privacy tools as well, is that there's very little incentive for adoption, and there's very little enforcement that they actually do what they say they're going to do, or that people are applying them properly. Um, this is something that Esther Dyson wrote back in 1997 um, when this was about a year into the P3P process. And Esther said, this P3P thing is a fantastic idea. I love it. But we need to make sure that we have incentives and enforcement. Um, and well, I think she was right. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of, a, kind of a, a disappointing note. But I think that, that that's where we are right now. And I will take uh, further questions. Um, well, so I think, I think there are a variety of, of different approaches to that. I mean, there, there are some people who will argue that users shouldn't have to solve that problem because you shouldn't have to um, basically pay for privacy, that we should have laws that, that say, you know, just like you're not allowed to sell your body parts, you know, you're not allowed to, to sell your privacy. And, and, and there, there are definitely people who, who believe that. And in some European countries, that, that's the law. Um, so that would be one, one way to solve that problem, is, is to just legislate it out. Um, another way is to say, well, no, we, we just need to, to lay, make, it, make users fully informed so that they know what the bargain is. That the reason it's such a difficult decision to make is because we don't fully understand the bargain and the trade-offs. But if we were well informed, then we could actually uh, understand that. And that includes understanding not just the immediate implications, but more of the long-term privacy implications, which get a lot harder to um, be informed about. And we could have tools that help us. So, so we're not left with just reading the website's interpretation where they're saying, well, you know, you're getting this great thing. And for just giving up this eensy weensy little bit of privacy, right? But instead, your, your user agent would say to you, um, do you realize that this, this consequence may come? Um, so 
I, I think there are, there are different ways that we can approach it. Um, but but I, I agree with your first statement, which is that the machine-readable policy doesn't solve all the problems. It only solves one, one small part of the problem. Yeah, you, you could certainly crowdsource both ways and have these are the benefits. I think um, websites could also do a better job of, of telling you what the benefit is. Um, you know, I, I think you see a lot of websites that say, you know, for excellent service from our site, make sure you have your cookies on, right? But like, all right, well, you're going to give me lousy service if I don't have my cookie. You know, what are you going to, you know, they, they don't really tell you what, what's going to go on. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So I, the way we posed the question to them, we we um, uh, did not make them think that there was any downside to um, withholding the information. Um, so it's possible that they independently assumed there would be, but but we tried to present it as. You know, it's totally up to you. You know, the main benefit of providing the information is that you'll get ads that are more likely to match your interests. Um, well, so I mean, most of my experience with, with W3C is, you know, up to about 2003. Um, and um, I didn't think it was all that an effective place to deal with privacy. I think W3C is really good at developing standards where the issue is interoperability and things like that. Um, and I think they were fairly ill prepared to deal with the number of lawyers and um, policymakers from around the world that descended on them to, to you know, do the privacy um, uh, piece. Um, and then uh, I, after we finished P3P, I um, didn't have any involvement in W3C. And when they started working on Do Not Track, they, they begged me to come out of my W3C retirement and come back and help them. So I, I agreed to do one workshop, um, and that was sort of their you know, what, what should we do um, workshop, which I, I um, shared. Um, and again, they, they didn't seem like to really fully understand what they were getting themselves into. Um, and then I've stepped away and just kind of watched from the sidelines. Um, and I must say I'm, I'm not overly impressed with, with how they're handling it. Now that said, I don't know of another organization that would handle it better. Um, you know, I'm also watching the Department of Commerce overseeing the multi-stakeholder process. Um, and they're really not doing much better. Uh, so, I'm sure somebody's looked at uh, taking the, the legal ease of trying to extract automatically uh, I don't know, something you should do or you should in some way format. Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're um, yeah, it, it is on the table, and actually some of my colleagues at CMU have, are, are doing some work on natural language processing to extract it, and then I have another colleague who's, who's looking at encoding the legalese um, once extracted, you know, into a a, um, uh, a rigorous format that that would let you reason about it, um, and and so I would say that that it's it's a really um, unsolved problem at the moment. I mean, there's definitely work on it, and there there's some there's it holds some promise that it, it could be done, um, but but it, it's fairly hard um, in part because the um, 
the language in the privacy policies is written at a pretty high reading level with a lot of um, extra clauses um, and, and referring back to things in other parts of the, the policy. Um, and there's also imprecise language and, and things like that. So um, it's, it's not simple, but, but I think it, it may be tractable, um, especially if you combine the automated tools with some crowdsourcing. Um, to kind of fill in the ambiguity, let the crowdsourcing fill it in. I, I think it, it may be tractable. Um, no, I, I, I think there, there are definitely some similarities between policies. You know, within a particular industry, um, I'm not sure that there's a lot of differences. So you know, if you look at you know, telecom company policies, you know, there's probably a lot of similarity. Um, we've seen in, in our work on the financial notices, um, you know, the first question I asked my students once we scraped all these policies and put them in a database is, are they all the same? And they said, no, they're not. <laughs> right? Like, OK, there's something interesting here. Um, my students were ready to conclude at that point that consumers have a lot of choices about financial policies. Um, and then I suggested that, well, if I um, am in, in Pittsburgh and I want to open a checking account, um, I really only want to choose from banks that offer checking accounts to people who live in Pittsburgh. And not to, you know, they were like, oh, there's some great agricultural banks in Iowa. I'm like, this doesn't help me open a checking account in Pittsburgh. Um, so some of the work that we have that's still ongoing is looking within specific categories and seeing, do you have a lot of diversity within a category? Um, or is it only between categories where you have the diversity? And, and even beyond financial, then you could say, given any kind of industry, are we seeing similarity only within an industry sector or also across sectors? Um, so are you referring to, to the anti-phishing fill or would, would uh, in, in general, like the privacy policy, how to make uh, average users to pay more attention to these privacy policies. We plan to add some modules in development uh, security tool that we developed internally or Oh, the, the, yeah. Um, so I mean, we, we've developed lots of prototype tools with different kinds of awareness. And none of these are um, uh, meant uh, as products, with the exception of, of a couple that have been productized. So in the anti-phishing space, we developed a lot of tools to make people aware of, of the phishing problem. And we actually did spin off a startup company um, that, that has commercialized our anti-phishing tools. And um, companies are now using them basically for employee training, or in some cases, customer training. Um, on the, the privacy tool front, um, uh, we, you know, we never really got enough traction to, to make it worthwhile to, to you know, commercialize it or, or whatnot. But my, my students will continue to, to make tools and try them out and <laughs> see what happens and see if anything sticks. So. About privacy, yeah. um, well, there there are a bunch of these third-party um, plugins. So Ghostery um, and uh, Privacy Choice are, are two examples. Um, uh, Abine, which is here in Boston, has some privacy tools that are um, designed for end users that that can also help um, make them aware of the trackers on websites. 